Good morning, everyone. Today we have a presenter. We have Colleen Straley, the Account Development Manager for Woodstream. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to listen to our presentation. Um, we are Woodstream. Woodstream, as you may know, is a plethora of brands. But today we're going to focus on Perky Pets, which is our bird feeder brand, and even more distinct, our hummingbird. Um, we are the leader in hummingbird feeders, so we're going to just talk to you a little bit about our feeders, hummingbird migration, um, and just all that you would need to know to feed hummingbirds. I have with me today the product manager for our Perky Pet brand, Cody Litweiler. He's going to go through the presentation, and I will hand it off to him. Cool. Thank you, Colleen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so the presentation, what I'm going to cover here is we're going to talk a little bit about the birds themselves, so give you some facts to give you some background on what we're actually talking about as far as the birds go. Um, we'll give you some migration information, which helps you with kind of seasonality, when you can expect the hummingbirds to be in your region, uh, beginning of season, end of season, that type of detail. Uh, we'll hit some sales numbers, uh, talk about how to hit some of the consumer care questions, so care instructions for the feeders, how they work, those kind of feedback questions, and then I'll hit a few feeder details and cover new items. So it'll be a pretty um, long-ranging presentation here. So the first slide here is um, kind of the general about hummingbirds page. and. Um, Generally what I say about hummingbirds is they are like a bird that Pixar would design. So if you ask the Pixar Animation Studios to make a bird, they would make a hummingbird. So everything about them is very unique. They are these super tiny, aggressive, territorial, flashy birds like no other birds out there and they all weigh less than a penny. There's these huge personalities and these little tiny bodies that we're supporting through all of our hummingbird sales. So our issue is never getting people interested in hummingbirds. Everybody loves hummingbirds. It's getting the feeders and the nectar in the right hands uh, from that point of uh, perspective. Uh, Perky Pet actually partners with the Cornell University with the hummingbird research. Um, any information that we're referencing, we're mostly pulling from Cornell Labs. They are great advocates for the success of birds, so we support them any way we can. We even partner with them to have a live hummingbird camera out in West Texas. You can go on their website and watch the hummingbirds any time of day. Um, West Texas has a real, very high population of hummingbirds, so we uh, provide them with free feeders and nectar and support for that camera to keep that operational, to keep the interest in that category. So hummingbirds are no different than the rest of kind of the bird species. The males are typically the colorful version, the females are less colorful. Uh, the color on the hummingbirds is for mating purposes, but also for uh, defensive and um, kind of fighting purposes too for the other males. Um, the habitat that they usually stay in is in open woodlands. Uh, they nest in the trees. They use a lot of very small fiber, fibers and even spider webs to build their nests. They're very delicate, delicate nests that they build. Uh, their food source, this says it's only nectar, but the uh, scope is usually about 80% nectar to 20% insects. So they eat 80% of their diet is nectar, and then the last 20% is small insects uh, that they feed on, and they find the protein in the insects naturally in the, in the, in the environment. Um, the other facts here, just hummingbirds beat their wings about 53 times a, a minute. Um, adults grow to around three inches long. They have legs that are so short they have to shuffle, they can't walk. So whenever they land, they're pretty vulnerable because they can only hop or shuffle. They're not like some other birds that you see on the beach or something that can speed along the ground. They, they're pretty much dead in the water as soon as they land. Um, they have great color vision. They actually see in the um, ultraviolet color spectrum. So humans can't see the ultraviolet color spectrum, but that's the way that um, birds are picking up on the colors, and I'll hit on the colors of the flowers and things later um, because we have mimicked a lot of our feeder color choices around uh, what's naturally occurring with the flowers that they feed from. And then the other point is hummingbirds eat 
um, every 10 minutes and they eat two to three times their body weight daily. So these things are little fuel tanks that burn up quick. They're flapping so fast, their heart rates are enormous. They burn through their fuel very quickly, so that's why you can have just a few birds in your backyard, and they might empty your feeder in a week if it's an eight-ounce feeder. And a lot of people, though, get dozens and dozens of hummingbirds, so that's why they have to try to keep pace with the diets of these birds. This shows the uh, migration map of just the ruby-throated hummingbirds. So you see the West Coast isn't shown here, but this is just the ruby throat, and this is the main species of bird that is actually coming up into the Northeast. Um, these birds originate down in Central and South America, and they fly up. Uh, you see your time zones here. So that middle section, the birds are arriving around April, and then they'll fly back around September. So it is a pretty large season that the birds are around. Um, you just know that as far as getting sales and hummingbird um, POS up, it's generally starting in the March, April time frame for the uh, the north, northern region. Um, there's also about 300 species of hummingbirds, but only a dozen migrate to North America. So there's hundreds of species of hummingbirds, but North America only sees about a dozen of them. And then the ones that come all the way into the northeast, the northern states, up into Canada, that's even slimmer down to just a, f a handful of bird species. So. It is rare that hummingbirds migrate, but we get plenty of population with the ruby throat because they're plentiful across the band. It's just the variety of birds you'll see in those regions is a lot lower than if you were down in Costa Rica, say, or uh, even down in um, California or the, the southern coast. Here is our sales uh, map of regions. Uh, when we're building out hogs and showing where sales are happening, across the U.S. We generally break it down by seed and hummingbird. So the SF is seed feeders and the HB is hummingbird. In the Northeast region, it's 36 to 64 uh, percent what we're seeing sales off the shelf for hummingbird versus seed. So in terms of the mix that's being offered or sales that you can generally expect from your uh, seed sets and hummingbird sets, it's a 36-64 split. Um, as you get down into central, southeast, you can see that the hummingbird percentage only goes up from there. So the hummingbird assortment is the slimmest in the north, northeast. It's dominant by seed, but then as you go down into the west and the south, it gets all the way up to 86% hummingbird versus 14% seed. And that's just dealing with the different environments of those regions. Hummingbirds like the warmer weather, so they're down there more often. Um, but it is interesting to see the scope of how the sales are impacting all of these different sales regions that we focus on. And these also help you build your promo mix. If you're trying to come out with uh, promotions or deals, you can kind of split um, your looks for sales based on these maps. Here's just a brief recap of um, kind of a broad estimate on the sales projections for year over year. Uh, hummingbird had a slight decrease um, from 2016 to 17. Uh, generally, it's a flat to slightly increasing category. 2018, we saw a, another uptick in sales. Um, we also split out uh, feeders versus nectar when we're looking at our sales percentages because those are two unique segments for um, when we're hitting the nectar is your repeat customer that's coming in to get the nectar every while, and then they'll get a feeder once a season or something like that. But you see it's a over a $100 million category, so it is a very large category. Uh, the split between nectar and the feeders is 70-30, somewhere in that range. And um, 2019, we're also starting out like 18, just a little bit up. This next slide is showing you kind of the care instructions for the feeders. Um, Generally, when we're, this is kind of the setup, so when you get the feeder to their house, these are kind of the consumer questions we'll, we're getting. Um, we usually suggest 15 to 20 feet away from windows. That's just to prevent some feeder uh, window impacts. We do sell window feeders. That's a totally different segment, but for the most part, um, it's generally safest to keep the feeders about that distance away. That optimizes your viewing distance and it keeps the birds at a safe distance from windows. 
Um, the hummingbirds like to be within 10 or 15 feet from cover. So when the hummingbirds are feeding, they're exposed to predators, and they like to know that there's a bush or a shrub or some tree nearby that they can quick run and cover in if something is in the area that they're not happy about. So they feel a lot more comfortable if it's not just, you know, the back of a wide open yard and your feeders smack dab in the middle. They kind of like to be near some other perching points or things where they can hang out in the shade when they're not feeding. So when we're talking about placement in the yard of the feeders, uh, we like to keep it kind of somewhere near uh, where they can have access to that protection. When we uh, talk about cleaning the feeders, this is very variable based on the temperature and the region you're in and also the season. So this says two days. That is kind of the max um, case scenario for if you're in the summer and you're in a hot region, your feeder needs to be cleaned out pretty regularly because of the, uh, the buildup of the mold and things that'll grow in the sugar water in the feeder essentially. So to keep that fresh for the birds, um, that's the worst case. Um, if it's you're in a mild climate region, uh, you know, a weekly is an appropriate time to switch out the nectar if the birds aren't um, emptying it uh, in your yard. And then um, the other point is we, we like to talk about hummingbird scaping sometimes too when we talk about your backyard. So that is um, dealing with growers and people that sell plants and nurseries. Um, there's a lot of plants that hummingbirds prefer naturally. So if you want to attract hummingbirds to your backyard, one point is getting a feeder that always has nectar out there, but the other point is getting and growing flowers that the hummingbirds are naturally attracted to. And our website has a whole list of flowers that hummingbirds prefer that you can go to your local garden center and uh, work with the associates to say, hey, I'm trying to b build a hummingbird garden. What are the appropriate flowers? And I'm sure they'll know um, some things that they like to hit. It's based on the color and the amount of nectar that those uh, flowers are producing. So those are just some other little tips to help you uh, build the population of birds in the backyard. Um, this slide is showing you the scope of feeders. I'm sure you're well aware of all the different uh, feeders that we provide and support, but I just wanted to kind of highlight each one in case you weren't aware of um, what Perky Pet is offering currently. Uh, so on the far left, we have the, the 203. That's our core hummingbird feeder. That feeder has been around for decades. Uh, Perky Pet is the oldest hummingbird feeder brand from uh, 1958. Uh, this, this feeder is, when people think of a hummingbird feeder in their mind, this is what they think about. So this is the standard feeder um, anybody needs. It's very simple to fill, very um, easy to use. It's tried and true. Um, it's our best-selling hummingbird feeder. Beside that is a glass decorative bottle. So a decade or so ago, we came out with a whole lineup of more decorative glass hummingbird feeders, and these come in a variety of colors and shapes and different um, antique trends that we've seen with bottle shaped designs. Uh, so we built a pretty big catalog, about a dozen of these feeders that are more uh, decorative. So hummingbird feeders serve the purpose of um, giving nectar to the birds in the backyard, but it's also a design element and we understand that too. People are putting these feeders in their backyard because they look pretty. Um, some people don't even fill them with nectar, they just want nice, colorful bird feeders hanging in the yard. So uh, we have to satisfy the decor element for the feeder as well as the functional nectar providing element for the feeders too. Uh, behind that, these other feeders are more in our core line too. We just provide a variety of capacity options. So we'll go um, from eight ounces all the way up to 48 ounces. That's the range of feeders that we sell. Um, that depends on the population of birds you have in the yard. So those people that are getting tons and tons of birds in their backyard or sometimes prefer the larger feeders so they don't have to uh, refill and have more maintenance on the feeder. So the high capacity options are just great for those people that kind of want to set it and forget it more or less and don't have to worry about um, monitoring the feeder. But the smaller ones are nice because um, they're easier to clean and um, there's less nectar being wasted if you're not getting a lot of uh, hummingbird activity in a certain period of the season. And then these other two are just examples of some glass decorative options that we offer. And you'll see 
Um, at the end of this, Colleen will swing back in and show you the selection of air feeders that we have to give you just another uh, overview of what's being offered. Uh, these feeders are showing the latest in the new lineup that Perky Pet has offered. These are the top fill feeders we came out with at the end of 2018 and have been rolling in now these first few months of 2019, so these are brand new. Um, we already have 50 styles of hummingbird feeders. This is the latest and greatest of our new technologies. So um, every feeder that we have in our lineup um, that I kind of just showed you um, have been bottom fill. We've had top fill before in plastic varieties. Um, this is our step into the decorative direction, though, for the top fill category. So basically what that means for people that haven't filled hummingbird feeders before, uh, bottom fill feeders, you always have to uh, <coughs> twist the bottle and then fill from the bottom of the feeder itself, which means you have to invert the feeder upside down when you fill it, and then you have to flip the feeder right side up after you fill the feeder. So bottom fill works because of the vacuum that's created for the nectar in the top of the vessel, but when you do that little flip dance, when you have to fill the feeder, you sometimes will get nectar spillage, or it's just more of a messy action that you have to take to fill the feeder. So what these feeders have that's different than every other feeder in our lineup now is we have basically what we call like a, the Yankee Candle Top lid design. So it's a lid that actually comes off the top of the feeder, pulls off, it's just pressure fit fit, you don't have to screw it or anything. Um, it has a little rubber uh, gasket we call on the inside lip of this feeder so it seals on the top and very easy to remove. Um, very easy to fill. These are all wide mouth openings, so wide mouth is important for filling the feeder, but it's also very important for cleaning it. And those are the two um, main points consumers care about when they're at, talking about these feeders. How easy is it to fill, and then how easy is it to clean? And we have eight varieties of styles. Um, when we develop these feeders, um, there's two kind of also new directions we've taken with this lineup that you may not have noticed, but the flowers that we use, we've actually broadened the color spectrum of the flowers that we're offering. So historically, hummingbird feeders have had red and yellow as the color spectrum in the flowers, and if you see our core lineup, red and yellow is maybe 50% of what we already offer. Sometimes we had gotten into white flowers, but this first part is we looked at the most popular hummingbird, or the most popular flowers that hummingbirds go to naturally in the world. So we try to mimic the styles uh, that are most familiar to the birds and the most familiar colors. So it's a myth that they're only attracted to red. They're basically attracted to any bright color that they see, and they're very curious birds. They investigate anything. Um, as I say, hummingbirds are just homeless people out there looking for free food, so they're desperate for any type of uh, food source that they can find. It's not like they have the luxury of you know, always having a fast food restaurant to stop by at. They're constantly searching for food sources. So if people are saying that their birds only like red, like yes, they may like it or prefer it or have always done it, but these birds have a huge appetite for nectar. They're feeding so often that, you know, they'll go to anything, they'll investigate uh, with their curiosity. So the colors now we have reds and yellows and blues and purples. Um, everything we have is mimicking an actual flower. And the next page, I kind of have some of the flower breakdowns for um, what we've gone after. Uh, another uh, point for the design of these feeders, so the choices we've made with the bottle designs, um, our industrial designers and engineers, um, marketing teams, we did a lot of research into kind of the antique trends and more of the bottle designs from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Our core market is 65 plus, so we try to marry up the trends of the antique markets a lot. So is the milk glass, is the fluted glass, is the you know cut glass, what shapes and styles are popular in those segments for like glass collectors or people that like inside glass decorative elements. We try to pull the indoor decor trends outdoors, so a lot of the designs you're seeing are candy jar shaped or um, this is our diamond wine feeder that's fluted or 
uh, rib designs, there's more of the syrup bottle or the whiskey bottle, like different types of segments we've tried to hit with the design elements for the bottles to um, help uh, sell to the decor focused um, hummingbird buyer. Uh, when I was talking about flowers, this is what I was referencing. So um, these all have the name of the flower that they're inspired by. So obviously it's very difficult to mimic a real flower um, look and feel on the hummingbird feeders. But what we've done with the flower material actually is uh, this is it's a more of a rubber material for the flower. And the reason we did that is we go to a lot of hummingbird festivals and we talk with the heavy users of hummingbird feeders and we love getting their feedback on what they like and what they don't like on the feeders because these are the people that are using them daily. Um, even talking with Cornell, we've heard a lot of feedback about the metal flowers we'd use on previous versions. Uh, not that they were bad for birds, it's just uh, the metal flowers you can't remove and clean. Um, they are also, you know, they'll rust a little differently. Um, it's a hard material, so it's safer for the birds to have a uh, nice softer rubber material. So that's where we've been building a lot of our um, flower designs and materials from now as kind of a go forward strategy. Um, the other thing that you see on the top is this kind of like snake tongue looking image. And the crazy thing about hummingbirds is even in 2018, they're still discovering new things about hummingbirds. And in 2018, they made the discovery of how the bird is actually getting uh, nectar from a flower on their tongue into their body. And it's something that they had always assumed had been done through suction, um, like a straw essentially, but that was turned out to not be true. The end of the tongue on the hummingbird is um, split like a snake tongue you see essentially here. And they actually um, discovered this because they took a dead hummingbird and they put the tongue into a water vessel and they saw that the action that happened with the tongue worked regardless if the bird was alive or dead. So it's not something that's controlled by muscle. It's just controlled by the structure of the tongue itself. So when the bird sticks its tongue into a flower, it's not wasting any energy. So it's not like an action that the bird has to use kind of their nectar fuel to source. It's not a muscle action that the bird is doing with the tongue. The tongue splits open and it actually grabs the nectar and then the nectar is then squeezed through the tongue tubes through, um, there's a, just the force of the nectar being in the straw. It's like the, the closing action of that tube. Um, it's, you have to see it under a microscope to understand what I'm talking about. And it had been kind of a mystery to the scientific community how they actually got the nectar from the flowers and the feeders into their bodies. So that's just like a super side note nerdy about the hummingbird tongues, but interesting because we're still discovering new things about tons of animal species out there. Hummingbirds are no exception to that. Um, this is a full kind of breakout of the top fill uh, design that we have. This is, we have many, many patents around the new top fills we came out with. And I'll just quickly run through the top notes on what's patented on the bottom of these feeders. Uh, because they're no longer bottom filled, we need a, uh, a float in the feeder to turn off the nectar flow. And this is similar to like the back of your toilet, how it has a stopper when the uh, water level gets to a certain point, it'll cut off the, the feed from the water. This is the same point. Um, this feeder, the float in the bottom of this feeder goes up and down. When the nectar basin fills up, it'll stop the flow of the nectar. Um, this is a closed cell foam. It's waterproof. Um, it's very durable, very easy to clean. On the outer rim of the feeder, then, we have a soft gasket. And what this soft gasket does is actually press up against the bottom of the metal and plastic covers of these feeders, and it prevents any leaking. So it's tightly sealed. Uh, leaking is a complaint we had got consistently when feeders blow in the wind, when they get uh, knocked around, uh, feeder, their nectar can pour out of some of the flowers. So this is providing one leak proof point. And then also the red discs you see around the neck of where the bottle hits the inside of the feeder, there's also a rubber gasket there that prevents uh, leaking from that point too. So there's multiple gaskets keeping all of the nectar leakage happening from those uh, points. 
Um, this is just a brief um, how to clean the feeder spot we wanted to walk through. So when you're cleaning the feeder, um, you're going to want to use unscented dish soap. You're just cleaning mop and then the feeder, most feeders only have, you know, three to five parts. So totally disassemble the feeder, uh, soak it in that warm water solution. Um, use your cleaning mop, scrub away any like visible buildup you see, and then uh, rinse the feeder after that and then just air dry. It's a very simple process. We try to keep it as um, simple to the structure as possible with um, getting these feeders cleaned after you use them because they do require, like I said, weekly cleaning um, to make sure that they're still fresh for the birds. And then this last slide just shows um, some of the other accessories. So. Hummingbird feeders are the core of the category, but nectar, as you saw, is about 30-25% uh, of the sales for our category across the board. And then we have things like hangers and mops and hooks and ant guards and perches and all kinds of other accessories that fill in the rest of our category um, that provide a little bit of the um, other sales add-ons if you want to have an add-on sale to just the feeder category uh, when you're talking with other uh, dealers and things. And now uh, Colleen will take the mouse back and just walk through the final kind of catalog pieces from Merit. Okay, thank you, Cody. Um, these next two slides, I just wanted to show to everyone visually just how many of our hummingbird-only feeders that are stocked in the warehouse. These are products that are in the warehouse year-round. Um, now for the spring and summer marketplace and the show, all products will be available. Um, we just kind of pull those, bring those in as we receive orders for them. But year round, this page as well as this next page are stocked in the warehouse available to dealers to order. Um, one thing I just realized I forgot to add on here on Cody's previous slide, the Amp Guard, which is an accessory here that has a disc of permethrin in it that helps keep ants away from your feeders. That is also stocked in the warehouse. The item number for that is W75245L. Um, want you to also keep your eyes peeled the upcoming flyers that are coming out, the April May flyer as well as the May June flyer or June July flyer. We will have specials on these products. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, before we close up here, there were a couple of questions that came up that hopefully between Cody and myself we can answer. The first question we received was, is climate change impacting the migration? So one of the interesting things about migration is um, climate is not really the trigger for the birds to migrate. Um, the point that they're using for their migration is the angle of the sunlight in the sky. So the sun angles. Um, is seasonally projected. So you know the sun is in different points of the sky throughout the season and the light change is actually what triggers the hummingbirds to migrate. Um, there have been climate changes throughout history, but something that stays the same is where the sun is at in the sky and that is actually what is triggering the migration patterns for the hummingbirds. So if you expect the season to be pushed off because of warmer or milder winters or uh, things like that, generally, they're still within a week or two weeks migration every year because um, like a warmer or colder weather might slow down their actual flight, but um, within that two or week window, uh, they're not being impacted hugely by the temperature. It's still the seasonality of um, where the sun is at in the sky. Thank you. And next is, does the red coloring hurt the birds? We get this one a lot. Yeah, um, there's no conclusive evidence with uh, red nectar hurting hummingbirds, and we work with all of the bird experts to come up with these, um, the, the research on these. If it was ever to come out that any of our ingredients in the nectar were harming hummingbirds, we would immediately take those uh, products off the shelf. And what we do uh, for our nectar um, uh, ingredients, actually, is we try to be as natural as possible. So we only have about four ingredients in our nectar uh, recipe, and it's just sucrose. For the only hummingbird nectar that is 100% sucrose, that is the sugar that occurs naturally in flowers. <laughs> and we have actually reverse engineered flower nectar to build our recipe, and it's very simple. When people make their own nectar at home, it's just uh, sucrose and water, and that's it. Um, our nectar has a little few preservatives to keep it fresh, 
and that's it. Um, when you look at the uh, chemical breakdown of a lot of our competitors, their ingredient list is sometimes twice or four times larger than our ingredient list. And basically any ingredient in nectar that's not natural poses the same risk to hummingbirds that red nectar does. If they're adding calcium, if they're adding extra electrolytes, if they're adding all these other additives in the nectar, all of these are unscientifically proven and untested things that are being added to the nectar. Um, red just kind of gets the calling card for concern because it's simply the easiest to see. People can't see all these other ingredients that other companies are putting in the nectar, so we just try to be as natural as possible. So we feel the, the heat and everything from all of the red nectar concern, but um, we have to understand that um, if we saw that risk out there, we would take them off the shelves immediately. That evidence is not out there currently. Um, and we are actively trying to um, answer those questions from consumers when we hear them and follow up with research to provide uh, pro or negative. It's just something that um, there is no conclusive uh, kind of red statement on that. And uh, um, probably last question for today is, does red versus clear have an effect on bringing the bird to the feeder? Uh, certainly, but um, what we actually do is, so they're very attracted to red, the clear they would not be attracted to. So we have red vessel plastic containers, we have red vessel glass containers. So if you don't want to use the actual red nectar to attract the bird, you can buy a feeder that has red colored plastic that you're putting clear nectar into. So that's one way to get around that question. Um, but yes, red is definitely a higher color attractant than clear, so if they see a whole red feeder with red nectar, they're gonna hit that uh, a lot more than they would another feeder that uses clear, but if you have concerns or if your populations you're seeing different trends on, uh, you can just get a feeder that already has a colored glass or colored flowers that are um, something you haven't tried before. Okay, well, I think that's gonna do it for us. Um, again, thank you everyone for your time. We appreciate it. I hope this was beneficial. You learned a lot and know what feeders to have. Um, that's it for us. Great. Thank, well, thank you. you very much. Very informative.